I'm, uh, I'm the uh, director of the Columbia Institute for Tele Information, professor at Columbia. Uh, I'd like to welcome you from New York. Beautiful weather today. Um, that's aha uh, ha. And uh, and you're, you're here joining from all over the world. Uh, we're very grateful. We are grateful to the panelists. We're grateful to Bill Drake for organizing this panel and this uh, uh, discussion series. Uh, so today, today's topic, as you know, that's why you're joining, is about the um, uh, UN uh, draft treaty, a convention that is being uh, discussed and possibly finalized uh, these days um, about uh, cyber crime. Uh, it's been controversial, although it's been uh, somewhat, at least uh, outside of the expert community. Uh, been no, no, it's good. Well, no, no, it's good. Under the radar. Uh, please mute yourself, everybody. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, now we it's controversial, uh, but it has been passed. Uh, the earlier draft, seventy nine uh, countries for it, um, so which is not a small number. Um, now, uh, the panel that I see here in the discussion of experts in the United States seems to be fairly critical of the uh, of this draft. Um, and I, I join that criticism. However, if 79 countries are uh, uh, of the opinion that it is good for them, one has to give this some fair hearing uh, and hear them out, even disagreeing, even refuting, but certainly listening. Uh, and that's important. Uh, the panel today might be more critical than supportive. So I would like kind of to kind of raise at least several questions to answer uh, and uh, brief, really briefly. The first one is, or points to make. The first one is in any treaty negotiations, uh, one gives and one receives. It's a give and take. And so it's in some sense easy then to uh, uh, jump on the points that one has conceded, even if they are painful, um, without kind of recognizing what one has received. So it is important to understand what would countries like the US, other developed countries, uh, what would they gain from that treaty also on the positive side? Um, a second, second point is, uh, I think we kind of all agreed that there is a crime problem and that there's a cyber crime problem. Uh, and so in some ways, one also has to ask the question, uh, what can one in a form of a treaty uh, do in order to deal with that? Now, crime is an issue that is defined in every country and every society quite differently. Uh, it is based on social conventions, on culture, on history, on all kinds of uh, political priorities. So there's no way to define crime and therefore also cybercrime in a uh, globally unified way. And so if you have a treaty here, and that gets me to the third point, which is uh, national sovereignty. In a way, kind of the world system works that countries, sovereign countries can make decisions for themselves and certainly about crime, which is a, a central issue. Whether they are smart or not is on some level their business, whether you have a death penalty or not, or stuff like that is not necessarily one of an international agreement. And the United States would never agree to be to a crime definition and therefore also cybercrime definition uh, that is the same with, say, Iran or Saudi Arabia or, or uh, uh, Russia or whatever. So, so we, U.S., too, would kind of want to protect our sovereignty. And therefore, one has to concede the same rights to countries that are more authoritarian in nature, such as China and Russia, as much as we possibly dislike the outcome. And so those are some points that I think I would like to see addressed and discussed rather than only focusing on what's wrong with the treaty. Uh, so with these words, I'd like to, uh, to um, thank uh, Bill for uh, organizing this and he can take over and moderate. Okay, thank you, Ellie. Uh, those are very interesting observations. I think ones that we will try to uh, and make sure that we bring to the fore in the course of our dialogue here today. Um, so welcome everybody. And uh, this is, as always, the monthly global digital governance uh, webinar of uh, Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, which Ellie's director. And uh, we meet every month during the academic year to cover a range of topics. 
and you, many of you have attended previously, you may know that um, videos and transcripts of our prior events are available on the website of our um, series. So for today's topic, uh, you know, for those of us who work in the realms of telecommunications and internet governance, there is an enormous range of issues that are being negotiated or fought over at any given time that all together sort of collectively make up this incredible tapestry of governance mechanisms of different scope, scale, strength, and so on that shape the digital order internationally, or at least help to do so. Cybercrime is one that I think my sense is a lot of people who are working more in the telecom internet world don't track as closely. And yet it is hugely important and it is uh, being conducted uh, among specialists, just like all of our other sub areas, uh, by a lot of people who are uh, legal scholars and experts who engage very deeply in a variety of different processes. And this work has been playing out over the past 25 years at a variety of different multiple levels and among governments in different types of groupings uh, with work on cybercrime, mutual law enforcement, and, and so on. At the broad multilateral level, the most important result of these efforts to date, of course, has been the Budapest Convention on Crime, cybercrime negotiated in the Council of Europe in 2001. They also had additional protocols in 2003 and 2022. Uh, the Budapest system sets out a binding treaty that addresses cybercrime and it enables procedural powers. It promotes international cooperation and mutual legal assistance and, and a number of different key issues and really focus a lot on sort of core cybercrime, what pe most, pe most people would think of as cybercrime, stuff that's actually uh, attacking uh, connected systems or networks uh, or using those systems uh, frontally to do so. Uh, and also covers computer related crime like fraud, things like that, and some content related stuff, uh, child pornography, intellectual property with an uh, optional bit on hate speech because not everybody can agree on that. It is not an unproblematic framework, but it's the best we have out there today. And the convention was done with explicitly global ambition. Uh, not only were the Council of Europe's 46 members participants, but so was the United States, Canada, Japan, many others. There's now 68 partners, parties from around the world and 15 more have signed on to exceed. So you think we have a system that we're already building. Um, nevertheless, Russia, China, allies of theirs and others have long refused to join the Budapest Convention and have insisted that there's a need for a broader multilateral framework under the United Nations in which they would have a more direct hand in shaping things. And not surprisingly, uh, Russia has been looking for many efforts uh, around uh, internet issues to leverage the mechanisms of the United Nations and the rules and procedures to its advantage. And so you are probably aware that in the parallel parallel world of cyber security, Russia in 1998 called for a UN framework on interstate cyber conflict. And in 2011 put out a big proposal with China, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan calling for cooperation against dissemination of information that some states might believe incites terrorism, secessionism, or extremism, which really harkens back to the to the uh, Carlsbad treaties, Carlsbad decrees of 1819, when the German Confederation was trying to suppress speech. Um, they also asked for language that would uh, prevent uh, actions that would undermine other countries' political, economic, and social stability, as well as their spiritual and cultural environments, which is pretty pretty broad and that uh, the UN should help to protect states' sovereign information spaces, which became sort of the beginning of their long running argument that there's something called a national internet segment, which could be subject completely to their digital sovereignty and the UN should do it. So the cybercrime stuff has to be viewed in the context of this larger effort on the part of Russia, China, and others to leverage the UN mechanisms for their aims. In December, 2019, the UN General Assembly approved on a rather divided 7960 vote, as Ali mentioned, with 33 abstentions, a Russian-driven uh, resolution calling for the negotiation of an international, international convention on cybercrime. And it was backed by China, Iran, many other like-minded countries, and it led to the creation of the Ad Hoc Committee, the AHC, uh, which held six sessions in New York and Vienna in 2022 and 2023, 
And, not, and the process has now reached a turning point with a so-called concluding session. We'll see if there's more uh, being held next week, January 29th, February 9th, here in New York. So people will be coming into New York who follow these issues to keep a handle on these negotiations, which will present a lot of hard choices for Democrats and others who might desire to have good UN framework for dealing with cybercrime where it could be useful, perhaps something akin to the Budapest Convention, but the direction of movement so far uh, seems to be different. There are a lot of ideas that have been put on, on the table by various parties throughout this process, and some of which may come back again, uh, that are highly problematic. And the draft text that is uh, the baseline for this negotiation looks difficult. So there are a lot of issues in play. We're gonna talk about them today. And to do that, we have an excellent panel of uh, experts and analysts and participants who have been involved in these issues. Uh, Nick Ashton Hart, who you see there, is the Senior Director for Digital Economy Policy at APCO Worldwide. Nick participates in the UN Cybercrime Convention negotiations as the head of delegation for the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, which is a coalition of 150 private sector companies uh, that are involved in the digital environment. Nick also participates in other international organization processes, uh, including as a member of the UK delegation to the ITU, and he's very involved in WTO stuff in Geneva. Katitza Rodriguez, who, has she arrived yet? Have we seen Katitza? Somehow it seems that we have not got Katitza yet, but I sent, I pinged her and I'm hoping she's gonna show, um, has been the Global Privacy Policy Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation since April 2010. Uh, in 2018, CNET named her one of the 20 most influential Latinos in tech. Uh, previously, she directed the International Privacy Program at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and she participates as well in the HC process as part of the Civil Society Coalition. Finally, uh, for a broader analytical orientation, we have uh, Tatiana Tropina, who is an assistant professor in cybersecurity governance at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University in the Netherlands. She is the co-chair of the Freedom Online Coalition Advisory Network and has held previous lead, uh, various leadership positions in the ICANN community. And she was also a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Crime Law. So that's our group. That's our topic area. And the mechanics will be, as always, uh, that I will uh, we will do three to four rounds of uh, questions through the tab among the panelists. Um, to try to elicit some of the main points. Uh, these would be points that we've talked about in advance as uh, uh, a, a baseline to organize the conversation. Um, and then at, as always, at the top of the hour, we will move to open discussion among all participants. I see 61 people online here with us. So I'm hoping, including many familiar faces and people who know this stuff. So I'm hoping that we can have a very good and robust conversation once we get to that stage. So, that's the plan, the plan. So let's begin. Let's start from the top, I suppose, with the substantive issues. Um, what's in the current draft uh, document that will serve as the starting point for next week's meeting at the AHS? What do we anticipate uh, in terms of uh, previously problematic proposals that may resurface or other new kinds of things that states may try to put on the table? Why don't we try and talk through some of the broad substantive stuff first? Later, we'll go to sort of the political alignments and so on. Let's start with, for example, questions of definition and scope. This is key to any one of these kind of uh, topic areas. Um, how you define uh, cybercrime, terrorism, extremism, disinformation, et cetera, these are all difficult issues. And the scope of the document seems to go well beyond cybercrime itself. So these are kind of interesting baseline issues that I think we should take up. Why don't we just go in alphabetical order? So, Nick, why don't I start with you, and then we'll go to Tatiana. I'll look for Katitza. Go ahead. Thanks very much, uh, Bill. It's a pleasure to be asked, and, and I'm glad there's so much interest here, um, including my, my very good friend Cheryl Langdon. Oh, it's three in the morning in Australia, and she's dialed up. I, 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 I salute you. Um, that, that, that is one of the biggest problems with this convention is, uh, as you as you alluded to, the, the countries who are participating in it do not have a shared objective. They have very different and somewhat conflicted objectives. 
And so while uh, parts of the treaties say that this is only about cybercrime, it's not defined. It wasn't in Budapest either. Um, a, a group of other states, Russia in particular, would like the convention to apply to any crime, whether it is in the treaty or not, as long as a, a, a ICT was involved in the commission in any way. So simply using a mobile phone as part of a otherwise entirely real world kinetic crime would qualify for, for international cooperation under this convention. Uh, there is of course an argument about uh, the, the, the court conventions everyone does agree should be in, the core crimes are, are those in Budapest, though they have broadened the scope of some of them uh, in nonsensical ways. Uh, for example, the crime of fraud, which we've argued, you don't really need to decriminalize fraud Every, everywhere in the world. Fraud is a criminal offense. Um, the, the Chinese delegation would like the fraud article to be expanded so that a basic, so that any any decept any person who through deception induces another person to do something or not to do something that they would either do or not do is guilty of fraud so basically you can make anything as long as you 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 were deceiving and deception is not defined uh, that that would apply to anything that this is just one example of how this really isn't a cybercrime convention for, for a, a significant number of delegations. They just want a crime convention with greatly expanded powers uh, and with far less safeguards than, than they would have if they joined Budapest. Um, and on the other side, you have Budapest countries who, who don't want to see anything broader than Budapest in most cases, um, but are unfortunately willing to go along with uh, broadened scope um, because the, they're, they're copying and pasting of, of provisions, which is another of the, the big sort of cognitive dissonances here, is there's this notion, especially amongst Budapest countries, <clears throat> that if they simply copy and paste many Budapest provisions, they will have the same effect amongst 194 UN member states as they have amongst Budapest parties. However, Budapest when it was adopted, was adopted with a 60 page explanatory report, which specifies the rule of law based environment that we would recognize in democratic states as being the foundation. And then you apply Budapest provisions on top of that. And to join Budapest, you have to actually justify to the other parties how you have, in fact, implemented the condition. The, the convention's provisions in accordance with the provisions the, the, the elements of the explanatory report. In addition to that, Budapest's secretariat publishes regular analyses of the implementations of the convention by the parties. It's like a report card. And that includes how they are, how the provisions are implemented in congruence with the explanatory report's requirements. That's also missing here. So it doesn't make sense to argue that you will get the same result from a, from selective copying and pasting absent those two conditions. And, and civil society and industry have been very vociferous in saying, we don't accept this as, as this, this logic. We don't accept this as reasonable. <clears throat> um, the, 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 the major issue here is, it, it, well, it's several, but... <clears throat> One of the fundamental problems is copying and pasting Budapest without, without any of the time limits in Budapest. So you, you can access data under various conditions in Budapest, but there are time limits, 90 days, 180 days. This tree has gotten rid of all of them. So you, 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 can, you can have the data and you can keep it for as long as you want. There is a data protection article which, which subscribes how you can use it to some extent. But basically what you have is a system where the governments worldwide can pass around the personal information of individuals entirely in secret, perpetually in secret. And this is not congruent with the rule of law for, for, for a start or data protection legislation in most of the world. Um, but we would also argue that it's not congruent with the UN Charter. This is not, 
this isn't this is something totalitarian states might agree amongst themselves perpetually secret actions but it's not something that the democratic world should on a principled level endorse irrespective of the venue and this is one of the biggest problems with this convention is many democratic states because it is their justice ministries who are leading on the content are willing to allow the the allow things to go forward that you would just never like in, in no other area of domain of, of of international relations is the West currently in the business of allowing Russia any diplomatic victories, let alone giving them something that they want, whatever it is. And, and in this convention, they're, they're proposing to give Russia and China uh, this, this sort of perpetual access system. Um, and, and because it, it allows any two states who agree that something is a crime to cooperate on it. And, and so it's not, it's not about cybercrime and therefore it allows any two states to, to say, well, I, I, you, know, you're, you have a, a citizen in your state that is criticizing my government. So I want you to, I want you to turn over information about them um, and, and them. There's also extradition in this treaty and, and actually turn over them too so that I can prosecute them for this in my state. And because there is no ability of a service provider to say no to any request for data access under any conditions, Western, Western companies, well, global companies, would be in a position of having to collude with what is self-evidently not a crime in the jurisdictions in which they are headquartered or operate. In fact, participating in helping these countries might that might itself be criminal uh, with no ability to say no and because it's all a secret no one gets to know about these abuses that are going on and so, and so um it's particularly astonishing to me that that the western states aren't saying look i'm sorry it's complicated but in 2024 we can't have a secret data access regime globally that's permanently that's permanently secret we just we're just not we're not in a position to 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 we, we don't work that way. I, I brought this up with Western states and said, this is illegal. Like doing this in, 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 your, in your country would be an illegal act. Like you don't do this. You have warrants that expire. You know, people are allowed to be notified when their data is used if it's no longer important to a, to a prosecution or an investigation. So why aren't you even willing to stand up and say, look, we're not prepared to agree to this in the UN because it would be illegal for us to behave this way. And while the convention doesn't force us to behave illegally, we, sh we don't believe in endorsing illegal behavior globally through a UN legal instrument. And, and because we have, unfortunately, as I said, so many justice ministries are in the lead they, they are being silent on this question, with a few exceptions. Canada is very vocal in saying no to all this, that it's wrong. It's, it's not congruent with Western values, and certainly not with Canadian values, um, and, and that they won't be a party to it. <clears throat> but you would think that this is something where the EU, which is very vocal about the protection of human rights internationally, would be on this like a rash, and they're completely silent about it, basically. So hopefully that's helpful and not too long. Yes, no, it's very helpful, but um, a lot of it uh, bleeds into the next set of questions about the, what the players are doing and so on. I want to say uh, um, closer to the, the fundamental question of scope and definitions, the baseline for trying to do this are, you know, so people understand exactly what is being proposed here in terms of the reach of this thing and the foundations upon which it would stand. Uh, Kizitsi, you're with us now. Fantastic. Would you like to go next, or shall uh, shall I go to Tatiana? You have to mute. Unmute. I felt, I guess, right. So it's better Tatiana, and then I see where we are in the discussion. Okay, and I can jump. great. Let's go with Tatiana. Go ahead. Thank you, Katitsa. And um, okay, so just uh, about the scope. I just want everybody to, everybody to understand when we when when we say scope or substance. It's a bit different when it comes to a criminal justice treaty. The scope in what has been proposed has three layers or three tiers, if, if I may. One of them 
is the scope of what we consider crime, right? What is criminalized? And it, it blends into answering Ellie's question in a more general, more specific way. Of course, uh, a, a, a big criminal justice treaty cannot you know, approximate what states can or cannot consider crime. Of course, they're sovereign states. But I would respectively disagree that states are absolutely free to decide what they consider crime, whom they are going to cut head or hand. There are international human rights obligations that serve a benchmark. Of course, states do not follow them, but there are some benchmarks, there are some limitations, at least formally. Now, when it comes to the UN Cybercrime Treaty, if we look at the process and trace this process, at the beginning, the consolidated, the consolidated negotiating document contained all the laundry list of crimes that countries wanted to be in this convention, including extremism, terrorism, and by the way, all other illegal acts that country might consider illegal, right? So imagine this uh, uh, criminal law Christmas tree with all the good, bad, and the ugly. Of course, this could not go till the final stage. Right now, we have a draft that resembles in its scope of what is crime, the Budapest Convention, except some of the very weird things, like Nick said, like this fraud by a mission to do something, which was apparently proposed by Chinese delegation, and which can be interpreted super, super wide. Uh, we also have uh, some crimes like intimate image sharing without consent, and we actually have a catch-all provision. Uh, there is the Article 17, which said that any crime on the international treaty <laughs> we've committed with the ICTs um, can, uh, sh should also be the subject of this, you know, all the measures and whatever, um, which is a catch-all provision because there is, no, there is no specification. So basically, yes, terrorism, extremism, drug trafficking and whatever for now are absent, but there is a catch-all provision which can potentially get the scope of what is crime to an unimaginable extent. This is the first thing. So what is crime? Um, a note, however, a caveat. I have seen a very relentless push throughout these negotiations to add everything back. Like, for example, in the sixth substantive meeting, Russia and some others tried to push again to add terrorism, extremism, coercion to suicide, involvement of my, minor in commission of illegal acts or whatever is, is on their wish list. So I would not exclude the possibility that at the concluding round, this a relentless push is going to be back. So this is the first pillar of the scope. The second pillar of the scope, and this is where, forget about cybercrime. This treaty is not about cybercrime anymore. It's about any crime that leaves digital traces. We are talking about procedural power. What kind of powers states can use to collect and access data in criminal investigations? And there is no limitation on this so far as I see. And Katitsa, I hope that you do not mind if I leave it to you because I don't want to speak for too long and you are the expert on this. So this is the second part of the scope issue. And this is no substantive scope. This is the procedural scope. And now even more dangerous thing, and this speaks to what Nick said about uh, mutual legal assistance and states being able to cooperate. So what happens with the mutual legal assistance? The, the draft, the current draft, tries to limit scope of data exchange in criminal investigations to the so-called serious crimes. What they did, they, they tried to limit, yeah, fair enough. They took the definition of serious, serious crimes from the UN Transnational Organized Crime Convention, fair enough. It's the crime which is punished with at least three, of, oh, sorry, four years of imprisonment, fair enough. The problem is that the, this, this limitation in this definition in the Transnational Organized Crime Convention exists only in the context of organized crime groups. So they basically took this definition in the face value, transposed it to the draft, wonderful, without any other limitations. And now imagine in terms of scope, many countries criminalized fake news, political speech, extremism and whatever, criti critic of the government, and these criminalizations would easily meet the threshold of serious crimes because many of them punished with seven, eight, whatever um, years of imprisonment. And these countries can legitimately cooperate using this convention. And this is what Nick was telling. And, and, and this, this is 
incredible because you know what? This is not cybercrime treaty. This is a criminal justice treaty. And if the scope is that broad and undef undefined with a relentless push to get it even broader, basically it's a treaty which says a country is free to define a crime and free to use whatever powers to collect evidence for any crime. And by the way, we're legitimizing cooperation on any crimes that you consider serious. What it has to do with cybercrime? My answer is nothing except some crimes, you know, which are pertaining to computers and computer systems. And this is something that cannot easily be undone. And coming to Ellie's last question, sorry for talking long. Ellie, you said that uh, in the negotiations, one gives and one receives, and this is give and take. I would say this is a very ill-defined consensus, ill-defined consensus for the purpose of this treaty. There is no give and take when it comes to human rights and violations. There is no give and take. There is no compromise on this. There should be none. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. That was well said and very concise. Um, okay, Katitsa, now you're you're settled in. Uh, what more can you you add to this? We're we're talking about sort of the foundational issues around uh, how the term core terms are defined and the scope of the agreement, what they're trying to get in there or not. Listening to Tatiana and reading all the stuff, it's starting to sound like to me this this uh, agreement covers any crime involving a person who has a crime involving. Uh, it, it, hopefully it's more bounded than that, but exactly what, how, I'm not sure. So, Kadetsa, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, I think that uh, Tatiana, uh, at least, uh, is, is talking that um, there are problems with the scope of the treaty, and there are three layers. She focused her speech on the, on the chapter on criminalization, um, and I'm going to focus on the two other chapters, the one on criminal, uh, domestic, uh, criminal procedural measures and the one on international cooperation. So um, both have a very broad scope. It's um, the domestic powers uh, to uh, access e evidence and to investigate someone it could be used for any type of crime when it comes to domestic criminal procedural measures. This means that it could be crimes that are even inherently in violation or contradict international human rights law. When it comes to international cooperation, um, one country can aid another state on using some of their surveillance powers, those that are stated in the criminal procedural measures, um, for the investigations uh, of, to access evidence to investigate crimes that are serious crimes with a minimal threshold of four years and no other limitation. The problem that we have here, because when you say serious crime, you think, oh, this is really problematic, a serious crime. But the problem that in many countries, just rain, raising the rainbow flag or just um, be, being yourself, LGBTQ plus means um, death penalty is a very serious crime in many countries. So what is happening is that the UN is providing a legal basis for, um, for authoritarian regimes to use the treaty to cooperate for the access a evidence for these purposes. Um, so, because many of these crimes that are inherently in violation of human rights law will be kind of authorized, this international cooperation, this kind of accessing evidence. You will say, you know, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, um, I have a problem here. Um, so one of the things that is happening is that um, the I lose my friend. yeah one of the things that is happening is that you will say well it's serious crime yeah but and um, these authoritarian regimes uh, will already cooperate between themselves well that could be true but you are providing the legal basis at the, under the UN umbrella to legitimize this type of, of, of cooperation. And that's not acceptable, especially it shouldn't come from countries with democratic values. And um, so this is like too broad of a scope and it just incorporates. One of the designs, just go back, one of the designed features of this treaty is that it defers all to national law. So in the scope, 
is the is defined to not it def, it define it let countries define what are crimes, and then they the treaty allows the cooperation according to those crimes as defined by national law, and that's a big problem. The other problem that we have and just um, beyond the scope, so that's one of the big things: the scope on domestic powers, any crime, and international cooperation, any 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 serious crime with a penalty of three or four years, depending on last four years. And one of these feature is because the design of the treaty is to defer to national law. The second problem that we have is the safeguards. So, um, well, we have a, a, a language that is very weak, especially taking into account all the development that has happened when it comes to government access to data. But these safeguards are in article 24, which is the articles of domestic criminal procedural me measures, only on the domestic surveillance powers. But this article is not applicable to the international cooperation. Why? Because the state has decided to defer to national law. And that will work for some countries like the United States or some democratic countries who have you know, a strong safeguards in place. But that's not the case for other countries. So there will be a disparity between this when a uh, when um, a country can disclose the data to a third country. The rule says in the treaty is that um, uh, uh, a, a country can uh, disclose, well, the requesting, the, the country disclosing the, the standard for accessing the data will be the standard of the, the country disclosing the data. So if the data is a country is the United States, maybe it will be a good standard, but if another country, it won't be the same. So we are asking for minimum standards in the treaty. So at least you can level the playing field when it comes to access to data, when it comes to the basic safeguards that we have always talked, like legitimate aim, necessary, and necessity, proportionality, even the principle of proportion necessity is not in the treaty. Um, transparency, notification, um, judicial oversight, and in some cases, prior judicial authorization when it comes to very, very serious uh, invasive surveillance powers. Um, so, so we have two problems with safeguards. One, that Article 24 is not robust enough, but 24 only applied to the domestic surveillance powers. And two, um, the domestic, the that article on safeguards is not applicable to the international cooperation. The other big problem that we have is on data protection. So the article the article allows for the inter, for the sharing of personal data in many cases without without safeguards for law enforcement cooperation. And it's very broad kind of cooperation. It could include uh, personal data. And they say data, but it could include personal data, even biometric data. But the treaty doesn't have minimum safeguards in the treaty to regulate this sharing of data among law enforcement. And so this is really problematic because again, it defers to national law. And that's one of the big issues for us that the many countries, it's just the different of uh, there's different protections among countries and there is no harmonization even to the minimum you know and and that's really concerning i think i will stop here and, and we'll defer to others too thank you that's, a, uh, that's very helpful and i think the <clears throat> the core point in a way <clears throat> that you're bringing out this is inherent in these kinds of agreements is that when the terms are not precisely bounded and clarified and you basically create a mechanism to tackle a problem where you leave it up to the interpretation of each national country to then decide exactly what fits the term. You end up with a mandate, you know, that gives broad legitimation and permissive international legal permission to more problematic countries to interpret the terms widely, to weaponize mechanisms to go after their opponents and things like that, which seems highly problematic. And this is true, not just of treaty frameworks like this, it's true of guidelines. It's true of a lot of the different types of instruments that uh, are being attempted in intergovernmental settings. You, you, When you try to have a coherent set of rules for such a disparate, geopolitically divided global polity, you end up with some 
Could, can we talk? Can we talk a little bit more precisely though about some of the kind of speech uh, acts and behaviors that are being addressed by this framework? Because I read some of the texts, some of the proposals that have been put forward. I see language that's for, pertaining to disinformation, pertaining to incitement, all kinds of things. Where I think are they are these provisions being consistent with international human rights law? First of all. Are they attentive to what the existing global frameworks are or not? I mean, what kind of uh, what kind of speech activity, what kind of behavior would be potentially more regulated if you implement something like the existing document? And Nick, do you want to start us? Nick, um, yes. <clears throat> I mean, this is this is one of the key questions, um, and the answer is, as you've just heard, because it's possible for any two states to cooperate on any crime that they you froze both recognize did I, I am i still present you're okay now it's just kind of a little okay. bit weird um yeah that's this is this is one of the key problems is because any state, any two states can define what a crime is between themselves and cooperate on it, or any two or three or four states, this this is a totalitarian state's dream, because they they and their friends can team up on anything that they want, uh, and call it a crime, uh, jointly investigate it, keep keep require any provider from anywhere in the world. To, to to give them the data that they want. And the whole thing is a secret. So like the, this is ideal. It's the old thing of, you know, what will you do? What do people do if, if you turn off all the lights? And we know the answer. They do things that they wouldn't do with the lights on. Uh, and and this, is, this is what we're proposing here is let's, let's allow ev any state to cooperate on any act they want with anyone else and keep it a secret and thanks to, to new provisions that have just been 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 added, <clears throat> it, it, it you could have said at one point, well, <clears throat> a lot of this data is in Western hands. It's in the U.S., it's in the EU, Ireland, whatever. So most of the data that that countries want, they're going to have to go to a, one of these states, and they're going to say no to the worst abuses because those states will not recognize many of these speech-related offenses as a crime, so they won't cooperate on them. Unfortunately, the latest draft introduces a new provision which would allow any state to go to any other state in, in, that's a party of the convention and demand and ask it to force service providers who have an office there to, to, to give them access to any data of that providers anywhere in the world. So like no one would go to Europe for data anymore. Why, why would you go ask Europe for European data if you can go to a tiny African state or a tiny Latin American state? And because there's a sales office of the multinational firm who has that data in the EU, in that country, they can demand the data from the sales office. And there's no ability of that sales office to say no, even if they say, well, we, we're a sales office, we don't have any legal ability to access this data. The, the convention is blind to that. The mere fact that it's the same company, the same legal entity that's, that, that owns it, means anywhere in the world the data is would have to be turned over. So, so then you lose all, all protections that you might otherwise have if the data is held in a jurisdiction which has high a, 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 you know, relatively high treatment of, of human rights and, and many data protections. You wouldn't go to any of those jurisdictions anymore. You go to the sales office in a, in a tiny state and demand the data that you want. Uh, so there's, there's, there's literally then no barrier left anymore and no jurisdiction is safe any longer and no firm is really safe. <clears throat> if you open an office anywhere you, you, and, and, you don't and you don't agree to go along with this, that your local staff will be arrested. <laughs> they're, they're a crime. They're, they're actually criminals for not colluding in abusing the rights of others. Um, and, and that, like, I, I don't, that, that the, there shouldn't be any treaties that facilitate that. And they certainly shouldn't have the UN's name on them. 
That is amazing. And that aspect of how it impacts companies and providers and who hold so much of our information and transfer it, I think is an important point that really has to come out. It's not just a, a direct, uh, the, the question on civil, civil liberties and human rights of individual users is one thing, but the constraints imposed on the private sector and organizations to comply with these laws strikes me as pretty onerous. Uh, Tatiana, do you want to add on? Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to say, in addition to what Nick said, uh, we already know, we already have examples how authoritarian countries basically took stuff of uh, communication providers and digital platforms hostages. We know all this. We have these examples. They are very well documented. And one, why negotiators somehow close their eyes on this? Like, what kind of impact this would have on providers is beyond me. But okay, you asked the question about criminalization of speech. I think Nick covered it pretty well in terms of uh, in terms of international cooperation. I just want to say that there is, a, I, I'm, I'm going back to my favorite horse, my favorite pony, um, um, the, the, the criminal law and scope of criminalization. There is a lot of optimism um, that this bill, what you saw was probably consolidated negotiating document. And indeed it had uh, misinform disinformation, fake news article proposed by China, uh, extremism, ter terrorism crimes proposed by Russia and what have you, or at the latest version of the, of the, of the draft after the sixth round. The new draft looks, looks, I'm highlighting this word, looks cleaner because there is no terrorism provision, there is no extremist provision, there is no, no, nothing. There is certain types of content which is criminalized is child abuse material, which is probably something obvious, so countries can agree on this. There are some problems with this criminalization. The, the, the current criminalization basically punishes uh, adolescents for um, sharing self-generated material. But this is probably solvable. Uh, another type of content that is criminalized, it's not a content itself, but non-consensual content, um, when the intimate images are shared without consent. It's also problematic criminalization, but that, that aside, it's not really speech or expression criminalization. With speech or, or expression, somehow people are optimistic that if there is no extremism or terrorism crime in, the, in this draft, then it's all good. Well, my answer is it's not. And I'm coming back to the point about Article 17 that allows countries to, no, uh, rather obliges countries to criminalize anything that is in the international treaty, which is committed to the use of the ICTs. And we have to understand that it's not only about International Criminal Justice Treaty. ICCPR, International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, is also an international treaty. And if you look at the Article 20, it says that Propaganda of war should be prohibited by law. Array, um, a hate speech, certain types of hate speech and discrimination should be prohibited by law. This is so much open to interpretation. And many countries would say that their prohibition of extremism, authoritarian countries, of course, against hate speech and discrimination and what have you, is all about balancing acts. And this article, which is a catch-all provision, would allow to criminalize various types of speech. So while we don't see speech directly prohibited in criminalization, when we look layer after layer, there is a catch-all article which would allow countries a lot of loopholes to do whatever they want. And then, as Nick said, there, there is there is a not even a loophole or open door. Come and get it allowing countries to, to prohibit whatever they want and cooperate on this by virtue of the United Nations Convention. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we, need, we need to move a little bit more concisely. I want to get at least more, one more round of questions in before we go to the uh, open discussion at the top of the hour. Uh, but Katitsa, just briefly on, on this point. Yeah, I wanted to react to one of the questions in the in the chat, which is relevant. Uh, it's about the GDPR, whether the EU will undermine or not the GDPR. Well, in the EU, you have both the GDPR and the police directive when it comes to access of personal data. But the way the treaty is designed is that it will defer to national law, meaning the data sharing for law enforcement cooperation will be held according to the data protection law of the EU. In that way, it won't undermine the EU, at least within the European Union. The problem is that it will, in any way, uh, undermine um, 
the cooperation with other countries outside the EU because there is no minimum data protection standards and the police directive is not everywhere. So that's something, uh, it's not like a, a global treaty and the, the global treaty on data protection, which is convention 108, is not being ratified by all the authoritarian regimes. So that's one of the big problems that we have. Just wanted to react to that. Uh, and finally, um, there is one thing uh, here. This design to defer to national law is not only from this treaty. We have it also in the Budapest Convention. It's the way it has been designed. Uh, and we have seen from the implementation and analysis of uh, domestic laws that when countries um, implement the treaty, uh, they don't implement for instance, uh, the general articles of the safeguards and the safeguards defer to national law, but it's just, it's not robust. You don't see in a comparative analysis of legislations of robust safeguards across the world. Even the factual basis for assessing the data is not like a basic requirement in many countries in Latin America. And many countries maybe in this model where transparency is not a default. And some notification to users and uh, um, even the statistics about government access requests is not like the common ground. And so we are really missing the opportunity, and democratic countries are missing the opportunity to try to have these safeguards in all those countries outside the US. Mm -hmm. Another problem that we have, and just to be very concrete, is that, um, for instance, uh, the criminalization section has some language about security researchers. Um, for years, it's very similar to the Budapest Convention, but the problem is that since 2001 till now, the Budapest uh, the developments when it comes to cybersecurity and security research have improved a lot. And there have been many, many countries that have recognized the importance of good faith security researchers for disclosing vulnerability. And, and so um, the problem that we have is that the treaty just copy paste Budapest, and that's not acknowledging any of the new developments. And that will harm security researchers because now this treaty has a clause. You know, security researchers do work globally um, and they can now be prosecuted by many countries at the same time because there is one article on jurisdiction that you can prosecute, they can coordinate actions instead of prosecuting if in one country will prosecute one the security researcher is just make the threat of being prosecuted at the same time in many countries higher than before. So it's two things, doesn't recognize all the safeguards um, and protections to exempt cybersecurity researchers, good faith cybersecurity researchers from the criminalization section. And two, there increased a threat against them by many countries to be so uh, be prosecuted at the same, investigated or prosecuted at the same time. So okay. that's just. All right, thank you, Kitsis, it's very helpful. Um, well, we have seven minutes left before we go to open uh, discussion. So I'm just gonna conflate a couple of points that I wanted to pursue with you just real briefly so I could get very concise responses, just to give people a sense of, who, you know, who, which states are, are driving the process and how do we see this thing playing out once we move into the next phase of negotiations. Uh, obviously, the Russians, Chinese, and so on, they've been very aggressive and putting forward a lot of very expansive kinds of demands. I've been puzzled by the role of the United States, uh, European countries, other uh, de uh, democratic countries in how they're playing this. I hear that the representation is from justice ministries and maybe getting a lot of law enforcement type uh, thought into the thing. but. It seems like, the, as far as I can tell, as an outsider who doesn't participate, like the there isn't a lot of pushback going on. I may be I may be wrong. So I want you to explain to me how do you see the politics of this in terms of the coalitional dynamics and who's pushing what, uh, playing out, and where do we think we'll be at the end of the the next two week uh, process? If we could do that, just really just two minutes each, uh, that'd be really great. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, to, to answer both your questions quickly. So um, that 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 has been a, a real problem is that there are not enough countries putting a break on some of the worst ideas because they tell us two things. 
A, well, don't worry, we won't do these things. So your data is protected because we won't agree to this stuff, A. And B, um, we, we, these things all work normally now under Budapest. So there's no reason to believe that they will behave differently if we, uh, if we expand the, the, the number of countries who can live up to them. And, and we have, of course, all said to them, oh, no, <laughs> you, aren't, you aren't able to protect everybody anymore. These provisions that you're allowing in will, would not allow you to say no. And why are you looking this through the, through the lens only of how you would use these provisions instead of asking yourself how the, 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 the people at the opposite end of the spectrum of law would use them? Uh, and, and their answer is, well, Countries are already able to do some of the, abu the, the abusive things that you are worried about. So since we can't stop them from doing it in this treaty, why should we, why, why try? Which is an astonishing thing for a country like the US and others to say, astonishing. And, and of course our response is the UN should not bless behavior that we all agree is outrageous, abusive and against international human rights norms. And there's silence by, by contrast. Or, well, this is a justice treaty and we're not supposed to be, we, we don't solve all problems in justice treaties. So it's, it's a really a breathtakingly um, bad combination of, of, of arguments. That is absolutely astonishing. Um, Tatiana? Every word that Nick said is my experience as well, with some deviations, with some deviations in individual delegations. Some of the countries take really strong stand publicly as well. Canada. Canada has been the most vocal. It's probably like kind of <laughs> last resort there, you know, for anybody who believes in human rights. Other countries are suddenly deviating even if they support human rights or silence or, or keep silence on some of the issues. What really strikes me, I wrote it, I and, and this is the same what Nick said. They say, oh, but, but we don't do these things and they do it anyway. Yes, but you are legitimizing their practices. And somehow we think that we are democracy today and we will de be democracy forever. <laughs> well, well, guys, you might not be. <laughs> Any country yeah. can, can slide into authoritarianism in, a, in an Augen blink, as we say in Germany, right? In an eye blink, in a blink of an eye. But what I also want to say, I see astoundingly, astoundingly, and, and this is hopefully, this complements to what Nick said, the absence of ability to put things into perspective. As I said, it's beyond cybercrime. It's a criminal justice treaty that will set standards that are not easily to be undone. But if you look at the rule-based world order as it is right now, the successes of authoritarian countries in using the multilateral system to advance and legitimize their practices, this treaty will give them the best present, the best Christmas or whatever gift you can ever imagine. And this will erode at the end the rule based world order as we know it. So the consequences is much broader than human rights, is much broader than criminal justice, is geopolitical and political and what have you consequences that somehow countries cannot see beyond their positions in these cybercrime negotiations. And this is what, what, what makes me really sad. You guys are not making me feel more cheerful, uh, but that's okay. Because uh, it's a final thought and then I open it up. You're muted. No. I'm concerned. I, hello. Yeah, I'm concerned with what uh, things are going. I will say that it's not only Canada who has been a champion in human rights. I will say that also Uruguay have put forward a very good human rights language that was supported in the last session by more than 50 countries but sadly was not included in the consensus document the, or the, the new version of the treaty. Um, so that that's um, like really sad. Um, obviously Canada did an amazing speech. I agree with, uh, with 
with Satyana, I remember his saying, criticizing a leader, innocently dancing in social media, being bored a certain way, or simply saying a single word, all far exceeds the definition of serious crimes in the States. These acts will all come under the scope of the UN Treaty in the current draft. And after those speech, first time ever, everyone in the room clapped. And it was like a moment when, oh my God, there is someone defending human rights. So that's Canada as something, a language similar protecting LGBTQ plus was put forward with Uruguay and sadly not included in the text. Just right. to, to, to finish, I have no more than say that I'm really concerned. The treaty is going to be uh, concluded in just one week from now. And we need to start um, being more vocal about the outcome and that treaty shouldn't be accepted if it's approved in the current form. So we do think that after the next two weeks, it will be approved. That will be the end of the process for the AHC and it will go to the General Assembly in the fall. Is that correct? Any reason to believe otherwise? Yeah, Nick? No, there's no, no possibility that like wicked uh, Democratic countries are all walk out and refuse to sign, nothing like that. We, uh, we, no, we are, yeah. we're not that dramatic. All right, we're now starting, we're now starting our uh, audience participation part of the discussion. Uh, let me just kind of make a brief comment, which is, um, as much as I wish that uh, Katsitska's position would be that of the United States government and that the EFF would run the country, the fact is that we do also have other constituencies and, for example, the law enforcement community, the intelligence community, and I have not quite heard what their position on this matter is. Not that it must be overwhelming uh, in terms of uh, uh, outcome, but it certainly would be important for us to understand that. So if you guys can kind of weave some answer to that question as you as you respond to other people's comments, that would be great. So uh, Bill, would you take now people from, from the audience? Just as a reminder for anybody that does wanna ask a question, please use the raised hand function so that we can recognize you. Please raise your hand, please say who you are. And again, as I said in the chat, I hope some of the people who've been having a very good conversation there and raising a lot of issues will consider raising their hand and speaking uh, now, we have a half hour. If you don't do that, I guess ultimately I'll swing back and try and read some of them, but it's much better if we could hear from you. So let's start, uh, okay, go ahead, Paloma. And please introduce yourself. Paloma, Hi, go ahead. Hi, thank you for this awesome discussion. My name is Paloma Lara Castro. I'm from Derechos Digitales. We are a Latin American NGO who have been participant of this process act actively since the beginning, along with Katitza and others are joining here. So uh, one of our main concerns uh, that adds up and complements the points that have already been raised by Katitza, Tatiana, and Nick uh, has to do with the gender implications of the treaty. So um, we have been concerned over the issue of how this treaty is going to have implications on gender equality, specifically regarding criminalization. So just to um, summarize some of the, the, the things we, we've been talking about is that even though we, we appreciate and we celebrate the fact that gender mainstreaming has been included in the preamble, we consider that this is not uh, sufficient to ensure that this, that this treaty is not going to be used against people in the, in the basis of their gender. And regarding, in relation to that, what we have been working on is a publication that actually Tatiana was participating as well in the revision committee. Uh, so thanks, Tatiana, for that uh, work, amazing work you did. Uh, we, we did an investigation, and just to briefly tell you about it, uh, with APC, uh, regarding how local cybercrime legislations are being used against um, people, uh, minorities such as women and LGBTQI communities, uh, with the use of the law uh, to silence and stifle dissent, and how this has serious implications on gender equality understanding that freedom of expression is a basic right to ensure for uh, gender equality. So what we want to say with this investigation that ten that uh, aims to provide um, evidence-based facts to this discussion is that we're not talking about potential risk, but actually actual harms that are being done. So as Tatiana and Katitza mentioned, this treaty, if it's approved the way it is, that it's being uh, framed, 
uh, not only is going to legitimize these type of practices that are already very problematic, but it's going to set the standards for other countries to be able to do the same. So this is very problematic and we were very concerned about these issues. And in the in the last negotiations, as Katitza mentioned, even though there are some countries like Uruguay that try to include gender as a protective human rights within the, 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 the treaty, this was not approved. And actually the discussions and the and the the positions of the of the countries are very concerning on this issue. There is no interest in including gender as a protective category or in considering how this is going to affect minorities. So I'm going to leave it at that just to not to go overboard, but I'm going to leave the investigation in the chat so you can access to it. And I'm also available if you want to talk more about these issues. So thank you. Thank you. And that's very disturbing to know that there has been no uptake on those issues. I'm very puzzled. Uh, Alexander, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hello, hello, thank you very much. I'm Alexander Savin from Free Moscow University. Uh, and uh, I have another set of concerns that uh, for non-democratic countries or for countries who are pretending to be democratic but uh, kind of autocratic or becoming such, discussions about uh, how this country is uh, presents or works on such conventions are usually clouded uh, or not publicized. So in Russia, we will know about this convention uh, from official post of official media only if Russia will be successful in putting something of its ideas, like Tatiana told, uh, into agenda. Otherwise, neither human rights protecting organizations nor academicians will even notice, well, except the ones who are working with government completely. Uh, so uh, my concern not about this convention, and with it also, may, maybe such discussions like happening here uh, should go a bit outside of academic world and well move uh, somewhere broader. Uh, especially, well, uh, as being in Russia, I feel that people or researchers like William or like Tatiana tries to abstain for any communications with Russian entities because Russia is very evil now, but it's really huge player uh, in uh, United Nations ground, using United Nations as uh, its political uh, uh, war ground. So that's uh, uh, maybe uh, for, for the further events uh, like this, it should not be just informative, but try to invite uh, more people from broader communities rather than, well, usual suspects on participants list from uh, IG organizations or academics. Thanks. Usual suspects. Okay. Uh, responses to those two questions from the panelists, please. Anybody? Tatiana, why don't you go? Uh, I will uh, skip this point and finger at me that, or oh, at academics, that we don't communicate with Russian <clears throat> entities. We have a reason not to, um, or those of us who do not. Um, uh, that's firstly, and I'm not going to respond anything to anything like this <laughs> any further, if it appears. Uh, now to the more general debate. I have been doing a lot to bring this debate beyond like academic and policy circles, and not only me. I think the 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 intervention from Diretius Digitalis, I think all the work Nick is doing, Katitsa are doing, there is so much more going behind the surface that you see. Because what you see is probably the ad hoc committee, a few blog posts and, and some letters, public letters sent about this convention. People are working at the background, raising awareness among stakeholders, among industry. And even if you look at this entire negotiations, it's unprecedented how many stakeholders took place, spoke against this, tried to promote human rights. And I would say sadly that in, if in some countries the, 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 the communities are not mobilized, the civil society is not mobilized, we cannot mobilize everybody on this planet. But I'm sure that each of us who is involved in this negotiation is trying to spread the word, is trying to raise awareness because we are all extremely, extremely, extremely alarmed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, others would like to briefly respond to the first two questions. If not, then I will uh, ask for next rounds of questions. I'm I'm looking in the chat and I've seen a lot of uh, points being raised by Henriette, Nigel, Cheryl, Sally, Obiama, others. 
So would any of you like to um, raise your hand and speak your question? Yes, please, Obiyama. And if I'm welcome, please say who you are and so on too. Go ahead, Obiyama. We've got your hand frozen and just your picture. If you're <laughs> There we go. Okay, um, good. Yes, please. You're muted again. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Obiama. I um, work with Media Rights Agenda, a civil society organization in Nigeria. I think uh, with respect to my question, I would like to know what the update is, is on the definition. Because for us as an organization, one of the fears that we, uh, you, you know, we actually share on the convention is looking at the, the realities of, you know, most countries in Africa where cyber crimes are being used to silence dissenting voices and press freedom. We worry about the definitions that we have right now on the convention. And so I would like to know what the updates are on the definitions that we have right now on the conventions, because we fear that most times when we defend our, our journalists and you know individuals who are being you know suppressed, who their right to freedom of expression are being suppressed by you know the laws in their countries, we worry that this convention actually now is something that the government will turn to to say, if you are saying the international standard is this, this is what the convention is saying. So we worry about what the convention is actually backing up right now because it leaves us with no international standards to run to when there's a convention that actually backs the government, you know, suppressing uh, the rights of freedom of expression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Obiyama. Uh, I saw Henriette Esterhuizen's hand briefly and then I do not. I'm not sure what happened there. Henri, no, my question that? my question was actually similar to Obioma's. There was a working group on definitions. And I think Mexico, South Africa were were chairing that. And and I was just interested in what progress they made and whether it was positive or negative from a human rights perspective. So the same question really is Obioma's. Because even if this treaty is not accepted, I think uh, you know, if there's agreement on language and on definitions that could then find its way into national documents, um, that's very worrying. Okay, great. Um, I'm looking in the chat. I see uh, Ellie Noam had a comment about law enforcement and intelligence communities and their role. Ellie, do you want to weigh in on that? That's what I asked earlier, which is uh, where does the American and for that matter, other countries, law enforcement communities come out on this one? So, okay. I was understanding that Nick and others were saying that they were problematic, but uh, Nick, go ahead. Um, the, 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 the attitude is we can have all of these broad powers, the safeguards are enough because we will always say no to overbroad requests. Like, like I was saying, it's, 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 that's the attitude amongst, far, um, amongst way too many of the, of the, of, of the, of the states. And, and then on the other side is you have a large group of states who don't have any history in cybercrime or international cooperation on regular crimes is, is also limited. So they're coming to this and they're looking to get some cooperation when they don't get it now. But because they don't have a history, they don't know what to ask for. And so they're foreign ministry people who actually agree in many cases with the issues that civil society and, and industry are, are, are telling them are unable to get buy-in in their capitals because the, the people in the capital say, well, but maybe we might need some of these powers <laughs> because they, they, you know, it, it, well, let's have them because maybe we need them. And if we don't have them, then then we're worse off. And 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 so it's a, it's a, it's a terrible catch-22 situation. Um, and the, 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 the response of the US and the EU and the UK and the others is, is all the same. Well, you know, we 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 just need to cooperate on cybercrime, and we're not going to allow any abuses to happen. Um, I will say that in some cases, it's worse than that. Like a certain very widely, a certain G7 country, the long democratic tradition, to use that term. Uh, I said to them, look, why don't you all stand for some time limits on any of this and some obligation 
that people are able to know their data has been handed over to a foreign government for law enforcement purposes when it's no longer necessary for a prosecution or investigation. He said, well, you know, someday we might, you know, I said, it's not legal now to do that in your country. It hasn't been for centuries. All warrants have time limits. They can be extended, but a court order is required, et cetera. He's like, well, you know, things might change someday. And I said, well, what do you mean things might change someday? You, you mean you're okay with asking for a power that would be unconstitutional because someday it might not be unconstitutional? They said, well, yeah, basically. So uh, like if you have a G7 country whose interior ministry takes that kind of exo uh, um, a position, wh why, would, why would you, I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> I don't know how else to put that. That, that's crazy. We're going to ask for unconstitutional powers because someday they might be constitutional. I also uh, want to, to jump here. Um, um, so, Nick, um, one of the arguments that law enforcement says or the United States or other countries says is that, oh, the treaty has some safeguards. It has dual criminality, you know? Uh, and, and so they will say, yeah, but the dual criminality is actually it's supply only optional and it's not mandatory. And this means that people could actually opt to not apply it and still collaborate in crimes that are not actually the same in the same country. That's one issue. Law enforcement will say, you know, or the United States non law enforcement will say, well, uh, there are some grounds of refusal, but even the provision on ground of refusal is very narrow. I don't know even if the political offenses get into the text or not, Nick, remind me that, but at least uh, we wanted the grounds for refusal to cooperate, in, to, to refuse assistance on investigations on human rights grounds, a little more broader than just political offenses. But even that, um, that's their argument. We have that. We can, we can refuse assistance based on these grounds of refusal, which is very narrow not even human rights violations, it's a grounds of refusal. But in our opinion, leaving such critical decisions up to the discretion of the government, authorities is really, really problematic. The treaty opens the gate for international cooperation for every conceivable offense. Those authorities are going to need to become experts in every crime around the world and their pot potential misuses. Uh, this is, isn't focused anymore. Rather than try to focus on cybercrime and being experts to be able to refuse, now that we need to know all these requests, it's supposed that this treaty was expedited, that request, now investigation of any offense, you know, they will have to be experts, every friend, they will have to re uh, respond to the request and to be able to refuse a data request, it will be super hard because they will need to have a lot of knowledge to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's just making complicated. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Tatiana, I see your hand. I, I do want to try and get a couple more of the questions in. Uh, so if you could try and make it concise, we've only got 10 minutes left and there were like four questions in the chat and I see another person with their hand up. Go ahead. Uh, so no, I just want to ask answer Andrea's question about definition. She <laughs> kept asking it on the chat and online. Right. So basically, Andrea, I don't think that the definition uh, um, the work on definition will solve the problem of broad criminalization, so criminalization of speech, because the work that South Africa was leading on definitions uh, is about defined computer system or information and telecommunication system or subscriber data or traffic data or whatever. So basically, these are very technical definitions for the purpose of the convention. They do bear some meaning. I think Nick said at the beginning that Russia was arguing for very broad scope, like even a phone. <laughs> text on the phone like used in crime and this is the ICT instead of computer but this does not really have any anything to to do with criminal criminalizing of speech so to me there there are separate issues uh, the definitions are very important but the consequences are very different they will not solve the problem of broad criminalization thanks Rory saying I see your hand but let me take a couple of questions that have been on the chat for a long time first and then I'll come back to you so uh, Nigel Hickson for the UK government said, this is all very worrying. I assume the EU folks would not sign up to a treaty that undermines the general data protection regulations. That's an interesting question. Um, and then Sally Wentworth from the Internet Society says, 
I have a similar question. I've heard that Canada is vocally opposed and the EU is silent. What about other democratic countries? What is their posture? We talked a little bit about the US. Any other views on, on these on, on Canada and Europe uh, that have not already been touched on by any of the speakers? Any quick reply? Yes, Tatiana. Yeah, I just want to second what Katisa said. Uruguay and some other Latin American countries, remind me Costa Rica, I think Dominican Republic and some others were super vocal and their proposals sometimes were, I'm sorry, much, much, not, I'm actually delighted, much, much better and much, much more, um, how to say, much stronger, much stronger than what European Union is proposing. And I think that that the, these efforts should be appreciated. And uh, Katisa, I mentioned Uruguay many, many times in other contexts. I don't know if, if why I forgot them here. So I would urge us not to think like Canada and EU and America versus all everybody else. No, no, no. There are many more countries standing up for human rights and and and, and global rule-based world order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one answer just to the, the GDPR question. I, I said the GDP, it won't undermine the GDPR because the treaty defers to national law. And if the EU has the GDPR, then the GDPR will apply accordingly. The same and with the probable cause standard in the United States when it comes to interception of communication. Okay. The problem is the cooperation with other countries. You know, it's like, okay, I'm a democratic country, I'm protected. I don't care about the rest of the world. The rest of the world will come, you know, that yeah. have any protection. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, the U.S. doesn't exactly have powerful uh, privacy protection laws. Uh, Rory Sang, go ahead, please. You've waited. Please say who you are. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I think Tatiana has covered a bit, uh, uh, in fact, holistically on the technical definitions and how they need to be defined, this being a technical treaty. What I think the media or the journalist community is concerned about, as Henriette said in the comments, that criminalization of freedom of expression goes against state or constitutional um, obligations of the state. But what I think poses a major problem is that we need to have a very deep line of demarcation between ICT definitions within the treaty and definitions of um, distribution of false information as may appear in domestic legislation. I think that if we take dissemination of false information as it is under the treaty, which is using ICT uh, devices or computers to produce or disseminate misinformation or disinformation, that needs to be taken differently from how uh, pro producing false information may appear in local or national legislation under receipt or dissemination of uh, information, for, in for instance. I don't know if I'm making sense. But what I noticed is that the, the media has tried so hard to merge or rather <clears throat> force their definitions to, to, to fit and uh, the treaty, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to know that these two things are not necessarily divorceable, but they're not necessarily meaning that we are now saying there's no freedom of expression under the treaty. Because even national legislation, dissemination or disinformation <clears throat> is illegal. We're only just elevating it at treaty level. There really isn't uh, no two ways about it. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Rory Sang, you didn't say where you are. Uh, where are you joining us from? Sorry, I am from Lesotho, joining from South Africa. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Jose, did you put your hand down? You had your hand down? Uh, oh, what happened is I'm running out of battery, so I'm, I'm going to, to connect. Okay. And, so hold on, <laughs> i raise ahead. it again. Let me just read, uh, uh, we're gonna move towards closing in a second anyway. And if you get it together quickly, then we can do something. Uh, I just want to read two more comments from the discussion. Cheryl Langdonor from Australia said, uh, unintended consequences result from less rigorous processes. And I suspect many unintended consequences will come from this. Uh, Vidoria from the United States said, in fact, we are seeing the transformation from democratic, for some definition of democratic, towards authoritarian all around us all the time, which is kind of a, a cheery view on things. Um, 
Jose, do you want to get a quick last comment in or shall I uh, wrap up? Yes, please. Um, I have a question. Please say who you are, where you are. Yes, I, I'm Jose Lopez Alonso. I'm a criminal defense attorney from Mexico, Mexico City. Um, um, I, I, I also a lecturer of, of, of university, and, and we are we don't have in Mexico yet a cybercrime uh, law. We are developing it. But my question is as follows: Given these enormous challenges that that, that imposes coincide all these sensitivities between countries with different human rights protection backgrounds. And given that in most all the international uh, extradition treaties and cooperation international treaties between countries, they already have dealt with these sensitive issues of dual criminality, exceptions to cooperation, exceptions to, to, to extradition, etc. Wouldn't it be more easy to amend each extradition treaty that exists with a specific countries and deal with these issues country by country instead of worldwide? Okay, interesting last point. Uh, Nick, go ahead, and then we'll wrap up. In, in fact, it's a great point. And in fact, it has been pointed out that UNTOC, the Transboundary Organized Crime Convention, already allows for e-evidence sharing. So it's actually not necessary to include e-evidence provisions in this convention at all. Uh, and, and, and moreover, that and the, the, the anti-corruption convention also contain extradition, handling of witnesses, and, and all these other provisions uh, that also this convention doesn't need um, and, and, and shouldn't have because what's happened is they're being copied over and then weakened. Like the, the protection of witnesses um, article is a perfect example where we started with, with UNTOC and now it's optional and left to each member state to decide whether or not it protects witnesses. Hmm. So, so yes, it would be much better off if people relied on the conventions that already existed. But that just tells you we're not really in the same business here. <laughs> At the end of the day, growing up, the Budapest Convention seems like it would have been a pretty good option. But a lot of uh, countries just felt like uh, we weren't party to designing the Budapest Convention and we didn't get to express our political preferences through the negotiations. And so we want a new one. And so here we are. But uh, I don't know what happens. Legally, I don't know what happens when you have two different multilateral frameworks that address a lot of the same questions. The signatories to the Budapest Convention might find, and tell me if I'm wrong, might find that they have obligations under Budapest that are not entirely compatible with the obligations under something new that comes out of the UN. Is that not? possible and if that, so then what happens yeah That's i believe true. yeah i believe lex specialis overrides lex generalis and I, the, the, the trans English Dick, that means like <laughs> that means like that means like a specialized convention will o override provisions that exist in a general in a general agreement like the transboundary organized crime convention so unfortunately the weaker provisions on, for example, witness protection would apply in this convention instead of the better the better protections that are in, in the Transboundary Organized Crime oh, Convention. Interesting. Okay. Tatiana. I believe that's yeah. I, I just want to say I agree with Nick that special and, and we have a lot of overlapping provisions. Some countries have mutual legal assistance treaty which are, which is more specialized and then they will use it and not Budapest and not something general. I just want to say that we can talk for a long time, what would be better, kind of how to fix mutual legal assistance and update other conventions and use them and they, we don't need anything new. I don't think that this convention was ever meant to really fix the issue of cybercrime or electronic evidence by those who proposed it. The, it the goal like is got, much, much broader than that. It sounds like the goal the is collection about of everything data. else. The goal is collection of data and many other issues, and nobody actually cares if there is a talk or a car and whatever. And this is why I don't understand what the industrialized countries are doing. But okay, we have to stop. I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank in particular, as I always do, Jason Buckwhite, the executive director of CITI, for making this happen. And I turn it over to Ellie Nome for uh, a final thought. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very much, panelists and audience. This was really interesting, really important, really timely. 
Uh, I My last thought is, uh, it does not sound, at least from the tenor of what I've heard here today, uh, that the industrialized countries are really going to uh, be supportive of this treaty. And so therefore, if the United States Senate or others uh, would not ratify, uh, then what actually will there be uh, meaningful out there if uh, enough countries don't go along with this with this particular treaty. So which gets back to the questions of more specific treaties or just leaving things as they are or bilateral type agreements rather than this kind of sweeping global covering everything type uh, um, uh, type, type approach um, that this treaty represents. Uh, and I'm not sure if I listen to this that there's anything that is ready for prime time, so to speak here. This is more like in the nature of a discussion rather than the nature of uh, refining an existing document that is ready and has broad international consensus and within countries consensus. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and we will, uh, yes, Bill, go ahead. No, oh, I was just waving goodbye. You're, you're raising, raising your hand, which I took as the international symbol for, uh, I wanna talk. But Bill, you uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you again. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Thank you.